Hello, and welcome to Advanced Theater's very own Linnea Encore Show. Now, before we get started, we would like to remind you of a few things before tonight's show. Please do bring and eat food or drinks inside the comfort of your home slash theater while watching the performance. Water with a cap is okay. There will be an intermission between performances, so at that time, you may leave your seat to use the restroom or refill on some snacks as needed. Please make sure that your camera is off and your mic is muted as it is distracting to the audience who is watching the show as well. We ask that you remain seated until the end of the show. However, should you have to leave during the show, please head to any areas inside the comfort of your home. Remember, you may use your phone as you please as we cannot see you on your phone during the show. So if you wish to do so, take pictures, videotape, or text when needed during the show as it is not distracting to the actors performing. But if it is distracting to you, please take this moment to silence your cell phones. After each performance, you may show some reactions by pressing the reaction button located on the bottom of your screen or in the chat box because in theater, we love to show how proud we are of every single individual who performs. As we would do in person, I want you to take this time to show some love and support in the chat for the amazing actors in their upcoming performances for you tonight. Woo! And now, everyone, please enjoy the Linnea Encore Show. I never ask about. One, the Tupac poster you've hung on the wall. It's old, wrinkled, straight out of the 90s. You've taped it up and torn it down time and time again. I wonder what Susan felt about it. You'll never tell me. Two, why you cry in your sleep. And three, where were you when it happened? I was a singer with New York City dreams. I was standing with a buddy to help save for the move. He was the first I saw it, turd. He tried to. I locked him in the bathroom and I ran for my life. I'll never make it to New York City. I'll never be a star. There's too many of them. At least I can sing for you. Not as loud as I could, though. We do everything in a hush now. Talk in hushed whispers, make love and grunts and moans. We can't let them hear us. They'll kill us if they hear us. You like it when I sing for you? It helps stop the shaking. You melt like ice cream beneath my voice. Well, we're down to our last can of peaches. We'll have to be leaving soon. You get to take the Tupac poster down again. Down south, always south. This is no longer a world for lovers. Love can get you killed. We both know there might be a time where we might have to leave the other, but now I have you. Well, some of you. Part of you will always belong to Susan. You wanted to let her turn you, too. But you didn't. You ran. I can never have your whole heart. But part of you is enough of you. For now, this is no longer a world for lovers. Four, where are your children? You never found them. You won't even say their names. Home. The only home I've ever known was a place called Sunday Dinner. It was the one time every week where the vibrant smells of my mama's cornbread, macaroni pie, and famous juicy chicken legs provided a true air freshener for her rampant alcoholism. Just as the meat fell tenderly off the bone, there was something about Sunday or cooking or maybe even both that allowed that sickeningly sharp smell of alcohol to tenderly slide off with it. Mama was never one to get dolled up for the occasion. Uh, she was a simple beauty that only liked to wear gloss on her lips as clear as her vodka on the rocks. Or was it tequila? I honestly don't even know anymore, but it was always clear and it was always.
always on the rocks. Kind of like us. Home. The only home I've ever known was a place called Sunday Dinner. It was the one time every week that Dre and I could look forward to mom being any form of the word mother. But boy, could she do better than that kitchen. There wasn't a damn thing on that plate that I didn't afford to eat. Well, except maybe one thing. Isaac loved her mashed potatoes. He always insisted that they be made from scratch. Freshly peeled the day of, and unless Mama wanted her face to match her potatoes, we had to spend every Sunday morning peeling and praying that the potatoes would be to his liking. That's how we bonded, peeling and praying and hoping. <sighs> Home. For so many years, it's been a place for peeling and praying and mashing empty bottles and drained spirits, <laughs> relationships on the rocks, <laughs> lips that was chicken grease, and a deep hunger in the pit of my stomach for change. And a napkin called hope that always got thrown out with the scraps. Thank you. Darnell, I just don't understand. I try so hard. I'm doing everything I can to try and make this work. I'm working my little job down there at the restaurant. I'm going to school. I'm trying to take care of Jesse. I'm trying to take care of your needs. I'm trying to keep this house together. I'm, I'm trying to make everything better. Now I come home from work. I got to go to the store. I come home, go upstairs, and I check the drawer. And the food money is gone. Now you explain that to me. There was $80 in that drawer that ain't in there now what you need it for. You tell me, Donnell. What's more important than me and Jesse eating? Now you know I don't touch the grocery money. Because whatever happens, we got to eat. If I ain't got clothes, I do without. My little personal stuff, I do without. If we ain't got electricity, Darnell, I do without. But I don't never touch the grocery money. Because I'm not going to be that irresponsible to my child. Because he depend on me. I'm not going to be that irresponsible to my family. Darnell, I'm not going to be like that. And Jesse, he's going to have a chance at life. He's not going to go to school hungry because I spent the grocery money on some nail polish and some Afro sheen. He's not going to be laying up in bed hungry and unable to sleep because his daddy took the grocery money to pay a debt. Now, you know what, Darnell? You be doing better than I have. But whatever it is, it ain't enough. Thank you. Mrs. Lewis, was your husband home at the time you claimed to have seen my client assaulting her brother? No, he was working. Was anyone home? 
No. Is there anyone who can confirm you were present at the scene when the crime took place? Your husband wasn't home. None of your other neighbors were outside, were they? Objection. Counsel is leading the witness. Oh, Lord. Answer the question, Mrs. Lewis. Mrs. Lewis, is there anyone who can confirm your whereabouts on the scene? I... Mrs. Lewis, it's my understanding that you've had some issues in the past with the Sampsons over the few years you've been neighbors. The compiling of these issues could have very well manifested a grudge or even motive against the Sampson family. So, we need to know. Were you or were you not at 8903 Bentley Road when you claim Clarice Sampson openly assaulted her brother Alan? Oh my gosh. Seriously, Murphy? I'm sorry. I thought I was on silent. Probably take a break anyway. Next round, we're switching roles. Playing the witness is a pain. It's better than being the judge. Listening to you guys argue and on be able to say like three things gets old really fast. Why do we have to do these fake trials anyways? Presenting our arguments in a simulated environment is good practice, especially if we're preparing for court. No, we're not actually going to court, right? Professor Wood said the group that comes up with the best defense gets to assist the DA during the trial. And we're going to have the best defense. So yes, we are going to court. Yeah, the DA needs help bad. I think I remember Warren saying all their assistants like quit or something. Where is Warren anyways? Who cares? You cares. You know the whole rant earlier and about how much you hate group projects and because no one ever shows up and you end up doing all the work. We've been fine without her so far. If she decides not to show up, that's on her. What could she even be doing that makes her three hours late? Probably. Robbing a bank. Robbing a bank? It could happen. Come on, Merv. That's totally unrealistic. Thank you. Besides, Warren could never pull off a bank robbery in three hours. It's possible. It's just like that one episode of Prison Break. You know, the one where Michael... Wait. You guys have never seen Prison Break? Oh my god, we have to watch it, like, now. Vic, where's the TV remote? What? Speaking of prison, that's exactly where our client is going to end up if we don't finish this case assignment. Look, our outline is due first thing in the morning, and if we want Professor Wood to choose us to help the DA, our defense has to be solid. I bet you're fun at parties. I am! Can we focus, please? What the hell was that? What the hell, Warren? I almost killed you. Really? With a history of criminal law textbook? Why do you have a key to my apartment? Why do you have a spare under the mat? I think I liked you better when I thought you were an axe murderer. Where have you been? Talking to the DA. She offered some pointers on preparing witnesses for the cross-examination. And you didn't think to invite us? You guys seem to have your hands full of these mock trials. I thought I'd start preparing for the real thing. Great. In that case, you can be Clarice. I call being the DA's assistant. Lazy much? Annoying much? Knock it off, guys. Thank you, Ray. You can be defense. And Clem, judge. That leaves you as a prosecution. Is there a problem with that, Miss Sampson? Let's just start. You're okay, let's go from cross-examination. Your witness. Ms. Sampson, you and your brother have been having issues lately, right? Objection. Leading. I'll rephrase. How is your relationship with your brother, Miss Sampson? I love my brother. We fight sometimes, but that's what siblings do. Could you read this transcript of a message you sent your brother the week of the assault, Miss Sampson? Don't even think about coming home. Nobody wants you here, especially me. Now... I have a brother of my own, Miss Sampson, but I have to admit, this seems pretty suspicious behavior for someone who claims to be on good terms with their sibling. Your Honor, is there a question somewhere? Sustain. Get to the point, counsel. How did you feel about your brother after he recommended you to rehab? I was angry. I didn't think I needed it. Angry enough to hurt him? Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, I hurt him. I finally got tired of him controlling me, so I snapped and now he's lying half dead in the hospital. Does that answer your question? Warren. Who's Warren? I'm Clarice Sampson, a woman guilty of attempted murder. Quit being obnoxious. 
Come on. You guys don't seriously think she's innocent. It's all just spelled out right in front of us. If you hadn't broken character and continued the mock trial, you would have seen that the text that the prosecution uses as evidence doesn't hold up their implications in context. And after disproving their theory, the defense would have countered with a stronger argument proving Clarice's innocence. You're all brainwashed. This woman clearly wanted to hurt her brother. She deserves jail time. On what grounds, Warren? What evidence are you picking up on? Look, you guys are good lawyers. You don't need me. So you're leaving? Maybe you guys came to law school to defend anyone who's willing to sign a check, but not me. I save people who are worth saving. And Clarice isn't worth saving? I think you know my answer to that. I'll see you guys around. Why are you so sure she's guilty? Drug addicts hurt themselves and the people around them, and that's all they do. If Alan stood in the way of her getting her next fix, she wouldn't have thought twice about hurting him. She was clearly angry Alan was trying to send her to rehab and retaliated. Drug addict? The only drugs she takes are prescribed to her by her doctor for her mental condition. There's no evidence of abuse. Alan suggested she go to rehab because he's overprotective and was worried about her. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. You've also never even spoken to Clarice. How are you certain what she'd do in any situation? All junkies are the same. Clarice is not a junkie. She's an innocent woman being wrongfully accused of attempted murder. Proved by what evidence? You're asking us about evidence. You're the one who came in here and started spewing junkie accusations with no solid proof to back them up. Hey guys. Look, if you want evidence, I'd be happy to lend you the case file, which you clearly haven't spent more than five minutes reading. What'd you do? Just look at all the pictures? Guys. So now not only am I a bad lawyer, I'm illiterate too? You know, Vic, if you weren't so focused on what I'm doing all the time, maybe you'd actually learn a thing or two about yourself. Can you guys shut up for two seconds? Hand me the remote. Murphy, for the last time, we are not watching that Just show. turn on Channel 4 News, now. As you reported minutes ago, the toxicology report on Clary Samson, the defendant in the New York versus Samson case, has just been released to the public. The report confirms that Samson takes three concurrent medications daily, which according to medical experts have been known to cause hallucinations and memory loss. Samson claims to have seen her brother being attacked by police officer Dean Hovis from an upstairs window when the crime took place, but she had also taken her medications the same day, which questions the reliability of her testimony. Officer Dean Hovis denies the accusation, although there is a substantial amount of evidence against him, including the fact that his cell phone location puts him in the neighborhood when the crime took place. Turn it off. Great. Prosecution's going to be all over this. We are so screwed. They talked about Hovis. That's good, right? The only thing anyone heard is that Clarice takes three different drugs. They don't care about anything else. <laughs> See? Now everyone knows Clarice Sampson is nothing more than a deranged prescription junkie who attempted to kill her brother for trying to, re to, to, tr for trying to send her to rehab. Look, you guys, my roommate works in the prosecuting attorney's office. If we drop this, I can figure out a way to get us on the right side what of the case. What the hell is wrong with you? We are not dropping Clarice. An innocent woman is not going to jail, not on my watch. You're also convinced that she's innocent. Because she is. Police radio transcripts show Officer Dean Hobus reporting a suspicious black male driving in the area within the same hour that Mrs. Ulis reports claiming to see Clarice assaulting Allen. And Hobus' record isn't exactly clean. That's just a coincidence. The medical examiner said that the bruises and injuries inflicted upon Allen were caused by a blunt metal object. So? So, after the time of the assault, Hovis showed back up at the Prestinct without his police baton. Clarice could have caused those wounds. She is 120 pounds with virtually no muscle, taking medication that makes her significantly weaker. Alan is 40 pounds heavier and bigger than her. Even the first responders at the scene said she wouldn't leave his side and insisted she'd stay in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. She was devastated. I really don't think she'd be able to hurt him. Sounds like a guilty, gaun gu guilty conscience to me. Look, Warren, here are the facts. Around 2 p.m., witnesses testified to hearing arguing coming from the Samson residence. Ten minutes later, Officer Hovis reports a suspicious male matching Allen's description when witnesses also report that Allen hadn't even left the house that morning. At 2.18 p.m., Clarice makes the 911 call that Allen is hurt. Twenty minutes later, Hovis shows up at the precinct without his baton and a scratch on his arm. And at 2.20, paramedics showed up to see Clarice standing over Alan, shaking him profusely. Yes, trying to bring him to. And the arguing? 
Clarice was asked about that. Apparently it wasn't even her and Alan. She was actually arguing with her mother about her job. Another sign of her aggressive behavior. You know, Warren, you might actually have some good insight as to what the prosecution might argue. If you help us out, we can help you build up a prosecution. You want my help? None of you care about justice. Clarice is violent and dangerous, and if you can't see that, you're as in the dark as Alan. Why are you getting so upset? I'm not. Yes, you are. Why does this case bother you so much? Why doesn't it bother you? Warren, maybe you should calm down. I don't need to calm down. Warren. Maybe you should all reconsider becoming lawyers if the only thing you're going to do is abuse your power to bring more pain and anguish into people's lives. Wait, Warren, you're not even making sense. Especially you, Victoria. You claim to be this great upstanding citizen who sticks up for those who are powerless, and the only thing you manage to do is become another dime a dozen cheap shot lawyer who takes another case thrown at you as long as it satisfies your colossal ego. I gotta go. Without your car keys? Give me my keys, Vic. No, not until you tell us what this is really about. I don't owe you an explanation. Do you want your keys back or not? I'll take the bus. If I don't have my keys back by tomorrow, I'll call the police. What the hell is your problem? We're trying to help you. I get that you and Vic aren't BFFs or whatever, but this is a woman's life we're talking about. It's not about Vic. Then what is it about? Guys, stop. She's not worth it. If Warren wants to let an innocent woman go to jail and hurt other people in the process, that's her guilty conscience, not mine. I just hope she can live with it. I do have one question though. You ever get tired? Running over and over again? I'm not running. What is it this time, Warren? You're so cool with letting Clarice go to jail over it, so it must be a good reason. What's, what is it that's made you so self-important? You refuse to see what is right in front of you. My mom! She was a user. All she cared about was getting her next fix. Theft, bringing random guys home, it didn't matter. They made her so angry. And later when she sobered up, she'd ask where I got the bruises from apologizing the next day without having known what she was apologizing for. What the hell do you do when the one person that's supposed to protect you just does it? Ren, I'm sorry. I should go. Wait. You don't, look, you don't see things my or our way, and I get why now. Your mom, I get it. But letting your past dictate this case, letting your mother decide whether or not the person Alan trusts most in this world gets wrongfully locked up, it's not worth it. But Clarice doesn't deserve this. And if you're willing, we can help prove that to you. You know what? Never mind. Forget it. You can go. Let's do it. You just have to prove she's innocent beyond reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, right? I'll listen. If you're still willing to give me a chance. This is just like Prison Break season two episode yeah. seven. Chance, huh? Okay. Aw, I think Vic just learned how forgiveness works. I didn't say I forgave her. So you don't forgive me? That's not what I said. Oh my god. Can you guys just end this so we can get back to work? Sorry. I forgive you. Okay, you two are cheesy and I'm lactose intolerant. All right. How much time do we have before our outline is due? Uh, about 12 hours. You're not even wearing a watch. Okay. okay, we need to convince Warren as fast as possible. Clem, do you have those evidentiary files from earlier? Actually, Vic, I think the best use of our time would be to do a mock trial with Clarice on the stand. Me as prosecution and you as defense. Best case wins. If that's okay with you. Yeah. That's okay with me. But I'm not going easy on you. I'm counting on it. Let's get to work.
Did you know I used to be afraid of dying in a terrorist attack? <laughs> My mom bought a gun after the towers fell and got all paranoid. And I mean, I love her and all, but God, she was such an idiot. I mean, she was so concerned over Al-Qaeda attacking her instead of her stupid freaking boyfriend who's actually hurting her. And I mean, he never touched me, but... I remember being so afraid of him. And he liked that. Anyways, she started coming up with these rituals to keep us safe from Al-Qaeda. But I'll pretend like they were protection spells to keep us safe from that douchebag. <laughs> and then the other day on the train, I see this guy and he's carrying this huge backpack. And I start to think about the attacks in London and how those guys held those huge backpacks. <laughs> and I look around and I see the only other guy in the train. And he's sweating, looking around in panic. Because, I mean, we're both thinking the same thing. We both know that if anything were to happen, he'd be the one we expect to take action. And then I just kind of started laughing because, I mean, that's so messed up. I mean, I was strong. I had the nerve and the balls. <laughs> I could totally take down the terrorists. In fact. I could be the terrorist. You can't be scared if you're what's scary. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Phoenix Wong. I'm 16 years old and I'm going to be performing a monologue called Rachel Alone from the play High School Coven written by the playwright Kayla Mayshin Garvin. And I'm going to be portraying the role, portraying the role of Rachel. I used to tell people my favorite authors are Stieg Larsson and Kafka, but growing up, my favorite book was actually Little Woman. Yeah, I mean, I got the big puffin paperback edition. It was like 500 pages long. And I read all of it when I was seven. God, I was such an insufferable child. I mean, still am an insufferable adult. Uh, JK, I only wish I was an adult. Uh, JK, um, no I don't. I mean, the thought of paying for a cable scares me. I mean, I get paying for the internet, but for cable? God. The government should cover that. I hate thinking about myself so much. I think about myself all the time, which is like, then why don't I love myself? If I think about myself this much, then I should love me. Cycles of self-hatred are my specialty. Do you think I can put that on my resume? I don't get people who don't work. I've been working since I was 12 and I love working. I almost wish I didn't love working so much and that I was just a pawn of the system, but dear God, I love to shop. And I have to do something to offset those costs. So, 
work at this dentist's office. It's pretty bloody. Mom says personally handling other people's viscera is empowering, but I beg to differ. Yeah, it's so funny how much I love shopping, yet my style is so, so, yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sophia Roger. I'm in the 12th grade. I'll be performing a monologue for the play Esperanza Means Hope by Conrad Paganiban, and I'll be portraying the character Survivor One. Uh, I think they're all gone now. You can't see them, can you? It's taken them a while to disappear. But I guess all the scars will never truly disappear. <laughs> um, aren't women supposed to be loving and nurturing? Gracious kind. We aren't supposed to hurt. We're not violent. We heal. It was different for me. Um, my abuse wasn't at the hands of a husband or a boyfriend. It was actually my girlfriend. <clears throat> she was my first. She was the one who was there for me, who taught me that being gay wasn't something that I needed to be ashamed of, wasn't something that I needed to hide anymore. She was the one person who loved me and allowed me to be loved. <laughs> but after a while, her love started to hurt. Uh, we would argue all the time and her put downs made me feel like I was worthless. She would say that I wasn't good enough for her and I started to feel like I didn't deserve her. God, I can't count how many times she would grab me by the shirt and slam me against the wall or would bang my head with pots and pans in my own kitchen. She said that I was too sheltered and that this was the real world. She said I needed to be stronger, that she was doing me a favor because I was just too weak. And because I loved her, I believed her. God, I really thought that I just had to toughen up. But I didn't toughen up. Uh, I, I didn't. Instead, I held it all inside and I grew weaker. Getting up in the morning just didn't seem worth it anymore. All my days seemed the same. I would look in the mirror and see someone with cuts and bruises and eyes empty of life, but full of tears. What had happened to me? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure when, but eventually it got to the point where I couldn't pretend it didn't exist anymore. I couldn't sweep it under the rug. Um, it showed. <laughs> Literally. How could someone I love be the cause of all my pain? There were so many times where I thought of ending it all. I, I, I couldn't go on living like that. But thankfully, uh, a friend was able to help me break through my sadness and brought me here to the my sister's house. Here, they helped show me that my relationship held more abuse than love and that I could still change my life. Thanks to them, I was able to begin the healing process. I found a place where I can see myself in others. And it's so easy to talk to you all here. We all have our own stories and it's nice to have someone to listen. Every day I remind myself that the first step to loving yourself is knowing that you deserve to be loved. And now I know that love doesn't have to hurt to be real. Thank you. It's before school has started and students are waiting outside, talking amongst themselves. Leanna is seen to be in the middle of the stage looking around. And to Sydney, who walks across the stage not noticing Leanna, as she's working on what seems to be a homework assignment. Leanna spots Sydney and walks up to her. 
Sydney, please tell me you're available after school. The Lunar New Year parade is today, and I think it'd be really cool if we went. Oh, hey, Liana. And it depends. I have an AP bio assignment that I still have to finish right now, and I have to study for a test, so I'm not sure. Well, can you just do all that on the weekend? Well, one, this assignment is literally due first period. And two, I'm not really sure if I'm up for hanging out, to be honest. You're never up for anything anymore. When was the last time we even hung out? Fine, you win this time. But in return, you have to leave me alone for the entire weekend so I can study. But who else will I spam text? Any one of your other friends, maybe your Twitter timeline. Just make sure it's not me and I'll go with you. Fine, just meet me at the cafe in front of the school at four, will you? Yeah, yeah, I'll see you later. See ya. Sydney exits and Jackson enters, talking to his friends. Liana notices him and makes her way over to him. Jackson, hey. Hey, Liana, what's up? Are you by chance available today after school? Shoot, I'm not too sure. I got basketball practice after school today, so it depends. Oh, because we should go see the Lunar New Year parade happening at 5.30. Gotcha. I'll see if I can. Practice ends at around 4.30. So I can make it, but it really depends on how much energy I've left. That's understandable. If you do decide to come, just meet me at the cafe in front of the school, all right? Sounds good. And hey, is anyone else coming by any chance? Sydney is coming. You know her? The president of the student council? Kind of scary looking. Yeah, I'm pretty familiar with her. You sounded a bit more hesitant when I mentioned Sydney. Do you not like her or something? It's complicated, but basically she doesn't seem to like me all that much for some reason. I don't think me going is going to go well. I'm sure it can't be that bad. Just come if you can, okay? Besides, maybe you two hanging out could change your mind about you. I'll think about it. The bell rings, and everyone starts heading off stage in different directions. Hopefully I'll see you tonight. Maybe. Leanna and Jackson exit on opposite sides. Leanna and Sydney are sitting at our table, conversing with one another. And then, when you think that the grandma and the boy are finally able to escape the void together, it turns out they don't at all. Instead of her being tied to the rocket, she tied the box of food to the end, so that when the boy pulled the rope up, he saw the food instead of her. It was so sad. And for what? Sydney? Sorry, I spaced out and didn't catch anything you were saying. You're super rude, you know that? I'm just kidding, I listened. Pixar sharks really are brutal. They're either super sweet or they lull you into a false sense of security only for them to beat the shit out of your heart and your tear ducts. I'd like to be able to create something so simple yet so powerful like that one day. I too want to lure people into false senses of security only to beat the heart crap out of their hearts. Jackson enters in a rush. Hey, Liana, I decided to tag along since practice ended earlier than usual today. Yay! Sydney, you know Jackson, right? I know who he is. Hey, to you too. Liana, I wasn't aware that you invited him along too. Well, I did invite him after you left, so... You could have texted me at least. I forgot. Look, you can just say you just don't want me to be here. I can go. It's not like it's hard. Jackson, you're fine. Sydney's just being mean. You're welcome to stay. Besides, it'd be fun if we all went to the parade together. Right? Speaking of the parade, it starts in about two minutes. You're going to want to hurry up if you don't want a bunch of people blocking your way. You're right. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Liana lunges out of her seat and grabs both Jackson and Sydney by their wrists. She drags them off stage along with her before they have the chance to protest. They re-enter on stage looking for a clear spot to view the parade. I can't see anything from back here. There's too many people. I'm too short. Well, that's unfortunate. Looks like we're all going to have to go home sooner than expected. Maybe. Or unless you guys have any other ideas. There's a way that we can still see it. No thanks. It's too late and I'm tired and... Sydney, can we please at least see what he has in mind before you leave? I don't trust it. My gut tells me that I'm going to be mugged at knife point in an alleyway. 
your gut is wrong. It's never lied to me before, and it doesn't trust your idea. You and your gut should lighten up a little. You and your gut are asking to be punched. Why do you constantly have a stick up your ass? Jackson! Let's just try your way, and if it doesn't work, Sydney can yell at you, I'll bet she wants, before we go home. Hey. Lead the way, Jackson. <sighs> just follow me, the both of you. Jackson leads Leanna and Sydney off stage. The stage goes black and everyone exits off. They re-enter the stage. The three are now on a rooftop of a nearby building that's high enough to see the parade, yet low enough to hear the parade clearly. Oh, what do you guys think? And hey, watch your step. We're about five stories up. This looks amazing. I can see everything. Are we even allowed up here? Don't worry. I come up here all the time just to look at the city. I'm basically best friends with the janitors that come up here. At least, I think. Uh-huh. Guys, I didn't get the chance to explain earlier since we were in such a rush, but I really do appreciate the both of you coming here up with me. Explain what? Just my gratitude, really. I used to watch these parades with my brother and our Vietnamese neighbors growing up, and we just continued to watch them even after they moved out. We didn't really celebrate it, but we loved to just listen to the music that played while we looked at the really cool float designs and the dancers and just how beautiful everything was. After my brother died, I just didn't want to watch the festival by myself anymore. So that's why I'm really thankful for the both of you being at least kind of sort of willing to be here. Now I feel bad for wanting to leave early. I'm really sorry, Leanna. Same here. It's totally okay, you guys. I get it. Anyways, Jackson, do you know where the bathroom is? Um, just go down the stairs two floors, and it should be at the first door to your right. Okay, got it. Thank you. Leanna exits off stage. Sydney and Jackson remain where they are, looking out of the festival. You really seem like you don't want to be here. I don't. You know, you could just leave right now. I can tell you weren't feeling too well. I can't just leave her after that story she told us. Again. I can leave, I'm also causing you not want to be here. It's more than just you and her. It's the memory this parade brings me. I try to pull excuses to get out of coming here and even using you as an excuse, but that obviously didn't work. It's just, never mind. You wanna talk about it? Look, I know we haven't been on best of terms lately, but I'm still here to listen. Only if you want to, of course. It's just, it's also my first Lunar New Year without a family member. I used to spend it with my Filipino grandparents. After school, I'd go straight to their bakery in Chinatown and I'd help them out until it was time to watch the parade. And we just watch it from the upper floor of the bakery while eating pastries. It was a highlight of my spring. What happened? 2020. My grandmother caught COVID. She eventually had to be hospitalized my grandfather kept his bakery open so he could pay for her bills with financial help for my parents and I. We hoped it was going to be fine. One day I was going back to the bakery for my job to check up on him when I saw all the windows were broken and go away Chinese virus, Kung flu, and stop selling bat soup were spray painted all over. There was even a brick of a note that blamed my grandfather and the Chinese in our community for bringing the virus into the country. It was disgusting. And because of them, my grandfather couldn't and still can't reopen his shop for a long time and struggled to pay my grandmother's bills. In the end, it didn't even matter. She didn't survive. I feel so stupid now for thinking it was all about me. But if it makes you feel better, I also had someone I cared about pass from COVID. My cousin. I still wish I were more strict on her and told her to stay inside and Wear her mask instead of letting her constantly go out with her friends. It's okay. And I'm sorry for your loss, too. Thank you. 
Does Leanna know about your grandparents? No. She's my closest friend, but she never asked. It feels good talking about it, though. Yeah, same here. I kind of find it ironic that you open up to the person you hate about something so personal before your best friend. Yeah, I guess it is. I guess I should have just accepted the fact that you liked her more than me. Maybe I wouldn't have hated you as much. I I'm sorry, what? Who? Don't play dumb with me. Can't you remember? I'm not. All I can even remember is that we used to be friends until you ghost me. That's so rich coming from you. Friends? You're such a liar. A liar? Were we not friends? Oh, you probably don't even consider us friends since you had the guts to just leave me. That isn't true at all. I thought we were friends until I found out you used me. Use you? Since whenever I used you for anything. You used me to get closer to Leanna, you dipshit. Oh my god. You really got the nerve to call me a liar? I didn't even use you in any way, shape, or form. How do we even know where you got that from? I got it from everyone you were close with. I didn't want to believe them, but you started to hang around me less and more around her. I was crushed, and that's when I realized that they were right. So I dropped you from my life in the harshest way I could. I, I still have no idea what you're talking about. Sure, I started talking to her more, but that's because I liked her better than you. In fact, I liked you a lot, and I wanted to ask her for advice. That's all there was to it. You're lying. No, I'm really not. But rather than confront me or respond to me, you decide to ignore and block me. My side of the story wasn't important to you at all. So, everyone lied to me? God, Jackson, I'm so sorry I... It's too late for that. You have no idea how much damage you did to me. You have to understand that I wasn't thinking clearly. I was hurt, distraught, and manipulated. Would you just listen to me? You're- How about you listen to me? I'm trying to give you an explanation. Take this as me finally confronting you. Please, will you just give me a chance? You listen to me talk about my grandparents and let me open up what I've been bottling up inside. Please, I'm just asking you to listen to me again. You know what? No. I'm done trying to reach out to you and trying to understand you. I don't think us being friends again would fix what you've done. Fine. Sydney turns to exit, storming past Leanna, who tries to reach out to her to no avail. Jackson? Uh, Leanna, how much of that did you hear? I heard enough. So... Sydney turned out to be the girl you wanted me to give you advice on? Yeah. God, if only I know she could be so infuriating. She makes me want me to pull out my own hair. You're no better I... either. What? You heard me? Yeah, but... Look, I'm really, really sorry that I failed to help you guys. I know that none of this was my business, but... The optimist in me really wanted to help ever since my friends told me that you two didn't like each other. I just thought that by forcing you two to come with me, I could at least help you two get along. I just wanted my friends to love each other as much as I loved them. I guess it didn't work, huh? Liana, I'm- so I shouldn't have forced you two to come with me today. Leanna unconsciously takes a step back away from Jackson, towards the edge of the roof. I really hope you two don't hate each other even more. Another step. Leanna, please, just- I should have stayed out of this. I'm so, so sorry. Another step. And today was going so well. Another step. She keeps stepping back and back unknowingly with each line she delivers. She smiles at Jackson, who feels something is off. But it's all right. We can always try again. Maybe next time it won't be as bad. Leanna, please, just step towards me and- I'll see you both next week, yeah? Leanna, watch out! <laughs> Before Leanna can process what he said, she loses her balance and falls off the roof. Jackson, who is darting towards her, peers down off the edge of the roof and sees a crowd of screaming people look at Leanna, who's lying in a pool of her own blood.
Lights up in a hospital waiting room, where Jackson is shown with an empty and cold face by himself. Sydney enters in a panic. Jackson, I came as soon as I heard, and I know now is a bad time, but please tell me she's okay. Jackson, please, I'm begging you, tell me, please. I don't know. Oh my god, I just really hope she'll be okay. I hope so too. You know, she was just telling me about how much it actually meant for us to actually get along. Oh? What'd she say? She just said how she just wanted us to at least get along and also how she wanted us to love each other as how much she, she loved us. God, she's so cheesy. Yeah, she is. Sydney, I'm really sorry about earlier. I went too far. Don't be. I was the one who did you wrong in the first place. I'm genuinely so sorry. Hey, I think that's Leanna's doctor going to talk to her family. I'm going to listen on in. Are you to the family of Leanna Kay? Yes, we are. How is she? Right now, Leanna is still in critical condition. We're still transferring as much blood as we can into her system, so it may take a while for her to stabilize. Does this mean she'll be okay? We're still not sure. Just informing you for the time being. Doctor exits. Once the doctor leaves, Sydney starts to silently cry to herself. Hey, it's all right. She's gonna be okay. Don't worry. She would have been all right if we weren't so stupid. You're right. We were stupid, but what happened wasn't our fault. Right now, let's just have faith that she'll pull through. Sydney only silently nods. She starts to cry more into Jackson's shoulder as he holds her in his arms, comforting her. The scene ends with the two embracing each other, having hope that their friend would make it out just fine. Um, uh, shit, how do I do this? Fuck you. Fuck you for lying to us, fuck you for cheating on mom, fuck you for dying. Fuck you for dying. Fuck you for dying. I'm so sorry I didn't forgive you. She just... Mira, she just showed up and suddenly, that really sucked. <sighs> because she just looked so much like you and God, she was so fucking nice. And then you just acted like nothing happened. And that made me angry, so. I'm sorry that I didn't come in that day. I should have been there. I know you thought I'd be there and I know you don't need me, need me but I, I didn't, I miss you. My heart misses you. And I'm not looking for some like spiritual sign that you'll forgive me for not forgiving you. I just, I need to, I need you to know that I forgive you now. I do, I'm still mad and I'm gonna get over it, but I can't do it like Nathan because that's weird. And this is fucking weird, isn't it? I don't know what to do. I keep trying to think back when we were kids, figure out if there was any way I should have known, but there's nothing. I would have never known. You seemed perfect. Do you remember that little blue Schwinn with purple flowers on it? You took me to the park with the, without the boys one time. It was gray and gross out, but we went anyway. You helped me get started, and you jogged right next to me the whole time, but you stopped to tie your shoe on the baseball field, and I peeked over my shoulder and shouted something like, Look how fast I'm going! Then I went right off the path and down the hill. 
I hit that fence so hard. I was sobbing and screaming and you ran after me. You slipped before you got to me, so I started laughing. And then you started laughing. Then you picked me up and brushed the dirt off my hands and knees and carried me back to the truck and we went home. Then got cleaned up before mom got home from the store. She never knew. When I woke up, my bike was tied in front of the house. You went back for it, I guess. Thank you. four things I never asked you about. One, the Tupac poster you hung on the wall. It's been taped up and taken down again many times. I wonder how Susan felt about it. You'll never tell me. Two, why you cry in your sleep? Three, where you were when it happened. I was a singer with New York City dreams. I stayed with the buddy until I had enough for the move. He was the first I saw turn. He tried to. I locked him in the bathroom and ran for my life. I'll never make it to New York City. I'll never be a star. There's too many of them. At least I get to sing for you. Not as loud as you could. And you do everything in hush now. Talk in hushed whispers. Make love and grunts and moans. We can't let them hear us. They'll kill us if they hear us. You like it when I sing for you. And it stops the shaking. I sing with my head on your chest. Here on your heartbeat. We're down to our last can of peaches, so we'll have to leave soon. The two buck will still come down again. South. Always south. This is no longer a world for lovers. Love can get you killed. We know a time may come where we have to leave the other. But I have you here now. Well, some of you. Part of you will always belong to Susan. You wanted her to turn you to. But you didn't. You ran. This is no longer a world for lovers.
for your children. You never found them. You won't even say their names. Thank you. Caroline was talking and laughing on the phone with Amber about a rumor they had heard the day before. <laughs> so you really think Carrie broke up with them because of that? <laughs> of course! That's exactly what Austin told me. And he's super close with her ex. Speaking of boyfriends, have you been seeing anyone lately? You were telling me about that one guy? Yeah, uh, let's not talk about him. <laughs> Turns out he lives in Ohio, and I don't do long-distance relationships. <laughs> we all know how that turns out. Oh, I totally forgot to ask you. So, I'm throwing a party at my house this weekend for my 18th birthday, and I really want you to come, Caroline. Aside, there's going to be a bunch of guys there, since Austin's bringing some of his friends with football. Amber, I would love to, but... My parents don't even want me to mention doing a show. Not to talk of going to a party. I mean, if my mom even finds out that I'm talking to you instead of studying for my SATs, she'd go berserk. Plus, have you been hearing the news lately? I don't know, but they keep saying something about a pandemic, and I'm sure my mom wouldn't even for a second. Caroline, second. you're almost 18. How are your parents going to keep treating like you're still five? Come on, just try and talk to your mom. Tell her that you're getting older and you need your freedom. Simple as that. After a few seconds of silence, Caroline glances over at the waitress poster on her wall. She sighs. Yeah, that's so right, Amber. I've been trying to avoid this conversation for years, but I'm older now. She has to understand. I think. <laughs> Atta girl. I knew you had it in you. Well, Austin's taking in a blind date and I still haven't gotten ready. So I gotta go early. Bye. Bye, Amber. Caroline is now in the living room where she meets her mom, still in her robe and on a Zoom call with the patient. She sits down at the dining table reading a Forbes magazine article. Yes, Mrs. Johnson. The prescription for your son should be sent to the lab by now. No, there's no need for further appointment. Yep. Of course. Alrighty now. You have an amazing day. Amy and Sakala notices Caroline reading. That's a wonderful magazine you're reading there. If you go to page five, it talks about all the amazing possibilities and pathways available for seniors who are interested in the medical field. I picked it up just for you. Thanks, Mom. Mom, look, can you imagine? The police dropped into this girl's house and basically murdered her and her boyfriend because they thought he was a burglar? That's ludicrous. First of Maud, now her? Oh yeah, I read that. Turns out her boyfriend was actually accused of possessing some illegal drugs. If it weren't for the police- Mom, well, what? I just wonder- That doesn't warrant the police killing them. Mom, I was watching this one article, one video about how the police system is and- Caroline, please, no politics. You know we don't discuss politics. I oh, dad nabbit. This dang knife is so sharp. Honey, would you mind getting me a band-aid from the cabinet? Sure, Mom. I'm sorry. So, anyways, what I really wanted to talk to you about was... Wow! The ointment, too? Why, look at you. Already becoming the doctor you're meant to be. <laughs> uh, yep, that's me, Mom. Um, but anyways, I really wanted to talk to you about something that's happening next week. So, um, you know my 
my best friend in the whole wide world, Amber, right? Uh, well, she's having a party next week because, you know, she's turning 18. And, you know, I was wondering, I'm older now, and I finished all my chores and assignments and... Caroline, we've had a conversation like this before. I know, Mom, but that was when I was younger, and you were worried that going to parties and all these extracurricular activities and all the, you're were going to ruin my grades, and you were talking about all these safety precautions, but I'm almost 18 now, and... Caroline, you're almost 18, and that's even more the reason why you shouldn't be going out to parties and instead be focusing on your studies. UCLA is no joke. And you need to have outstanding grades if you even want to appear noticeable to them. Partying is not going to cut it. Not in my house. Mom, I know that, but I've taken AP classes ever since freshman year, and I've been acing all of them. I have a job, I do my chores. I'm just so ready to just take a break and catch up with- Caroline, we're not continuing this conversation. My answer is no. You cannot go to the party. In fact, there's no way you'll be able to go because Sydney's coming home from college this weekend. I thought she was going on vacation with her boyfriend or something like that. Let me guess, you're sick of me and you'd rather have your favorite child come over. I persuaded her to come home this weekend for spring break to visit some potential medical schools nearby. Oh, and this COVID thing is scaring me an awful lot. I'm not so sure I feel comfortable with her being up there. Not to talk of you going to a party. Give me a break, Caroline. What? But I... Uh, okay, Mom. Uh, I'll just be in my room. All right. Well, I'm ordering Sydney's favorite mango cake from Red Ribbon the day before she comes. Can you just do me a favor and tidy up Sydney's room? We want this place to look as homey as possible for her. Okay, Mom. Caroline makes her way to Sydney's room to tidy it and notices it has been the same way it was left for months, untouched. She makes her way back to her desk where she withers away, hoping, the lights dimming to darkness and absolute silence. It's the weekend and Caroline is mid conversation with Amber on the phone, telling her all that had happened this week. And the worst part, Amber, is that the only viable reason she had as to why I can't come to your party is because my sister's coming over for spring break and the stupid pandemic. Even when I told her that I was like smart and responsible and stuff, she still didn't want to hear it. Caroline starts to tear up and tries to conceal it with a tissue from her desk. Amber, meanwhile, is shopping. Yeah, this is actually so perfect for my body. Um, do I have a size 6? No, a size 4, because I'm going on a strict diet. Oh, Caroline! Babe, I'm so sorry. There's just so many people and dresses. Can you come again? Amber, I can't come to your party today. I tried to... Caroline hears a knock on the door as her dad pokes his head into her room. Hey, pumpkin. Sydney's here. You should get ready to start coming down. Hold on, Amber. Okay, Dad. I'll be down in a second. Not a girl. Say, that's a nice poster you got there. Whoever got it for you must be a real G. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but please don't say that anywhere else, Dad. Um, thanks for the poster, though. It means a lot. Don't mention it, sugar. Water. Amber, you still there? Mm hmm Can you just get someone to pick me up later tonight? I have a plan. <laughs> you know I got you, girly. <laughs> You're so excited. Caroline, are you coming down? Your food's getting cold. Um, yeah, me too. Well, I gotta go. My sister's here. Bye. I'm fine. Thank you. Caroline reaches the dining room where she meets her sister talking with her father, with their mom sitting at the dining table praying over the food already set. 
Caroline grabs the magazine she was reading dates before and silently reads. There you are, Caroline. What took you so... Never mind that. Just have some manners and greet your sister. Hey, Caroline. How are you? I missed you a lot. Caroline ignores the question at first, but after a while, feeling the tension without looking up, she speaks. Amy, obviously annoyed, looks straight on at Caroline, who is still looking down. Coming across the page she was reading days before in the magazine, Caroline speaks. Mom, I know we don't like to bring up politics, but I really want to address what you said about Breonna Taylor a couple days ago, and I just didn't think it was the right thing to say. I mean, especially since I've been seeing a lot of posts and articles online about police brutality. Caroline! I don't want to discuss this. Your sister just came. Let's just all have dinner as a nice, happy family and forget all about this nonsense. Um, forget about Sydney for once. We can't keep pretending that we're a big, happy family when really we're not. And things like this are happening okay. in the world. I am fed up with this attitude, Caroline. Your sister just came to visit you and this is how you disrespect her? Caroline, this is your opportunity to get advice from a pre-med student. Whatever happened out there is not our fight and it especially should not concern us while we're eating. This is your opportunity to be great and follow your dreams. And you can just- What if they're not my dreams, mom? What if they're just your hopes? You never once asked me what I wanted to do and you never once cared about anything I've said if it had nothing to do with the medical field. What if I- That's enough, Caroline. But what if I wanted- Caroline. I am not repeating myself. I said that's enough. Honey, don't you think we should- What if I don't want to be a doctor, Mom? I want to be an actress. I'm not going to be like Sydney. I never want to be like Sydney. I want to be- I said that's enough! You're getting too out of hand. And how dare you insult your sister like that? Apologize right now! Over my dead body. Caroline! Caroline, come back this instant! Sydney, Amy, and Jeffrey sit in the dead silence of the room. While Jeffrey tries to console his wife, Sydney escapes into a world of her own, scared of the underlying secret she has yet to share. Caroline gets a text from Amber's hours later reading, Caroline, your ride is outside waiting for you. Checking the time, she springs out of her chair to get ready for the party. Hoping her family went to sleep, she sneaks out into the darkness of the evening. When she realizes it's Amber's boyfriend from a distance singing an odd tune. As the noise from Austin gets more and more noticeable, Sydney peeks her head out of the window to watch the event unfold. Noticing Caroline following the noise, she gets up and follows her to the front door. Austin, what the hell are you doing out here? Ever since she um, took me a few hours ago and said you might need a ride to party. Caroline covers her nose as Austin's car reeks of alcohol. Yeah, I knew that, but you're literally a mess right now. And it's already bad enough that I expect you to show up, so... Okay, everybody buckle up! They say we're going on a ride tonight, Austin! Stop! My parents are gonna... Are you gonna get or what? Just... Give me your keys, Austin. You can't drive around while you're- As Austin gets a call from Amber, he ignores Caroline and quickly peels out of the driveway, which slams the door shut. As Austin speeds off, she realizes that she's still in front of her driveway. Walking up the driveway to a crowd in front of her garage, she gets a text from Amber minutes later. How could you? I should have known all along, you nasty skink. Reading the text over and over, Caroline couldn't believe he lied. After a few seconds, Sydney then comes out into the dark of the evening to where Caroline is crouched. Caroline, shocked to see her sister's presence, breaks down into tears. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Sydney. I should have never talked to you like that. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Please don't tell mom. Caroline calms down as Sydney consoles her quietly. Caroline looks up at her sister in complete dismay. She couldn't believe that she would actually care. Caroline's phone goes off again. 
and it's another rage text from Amber. Sydney notices the text, grabs her phone, and replies, Your boyfriend is a douchebag. Do not ever text this phone again. Love, Caroline's sister. Don't worry about them. Friends come and go, but Caroline, if I have to be honest, I never wanted to be a doctor. I still don't. That's why I'm not going to be one, and you don't have to either. I dropped out of my biology major and I'm refocusing on film. That's even the reason why I came here, to tell her, but after the feud today, I never told mom because, well, I was scared to. What would she think of me? She put so much pressure on me to be an example for you, but at the end of the day, the best example I know I can be is to do what makes me feel whole. Being in the heart of Los Angeles, there's so many opportunities. There's so many opportunities for you out there, and if you want to be an actress, Caroline, be an actress. I promise you, life is too short for you to do something that doesn't make you happy. In shock, Caroline was speechless. She didn't know what to say or do next. In the corner of their eyes, she depicts the slim figure of her mother with her hands over her mouth. Mom, I... Mom, how much did you hear? Please hear me out. Please. Don't explain. Just go inside. After exchanging looks, Caroline and Sydney proceed to follow their mother inside to the couches. Seconds later, the girl's father comes whistling out looking for a midnight snack. Noticing the congregation, he tries to leave. Uh-uh. Jeff, you're part of this too. Hey, girls, what's crack a lack? <sighs> girls, I... Growing up, believe it or not, I always wanted to be a singer. I would perform at shows, sing in choir, everything. But my mother would always call my singing a distraction. She would always want me to take harder classes and focus on science because she wanted me to become what I am today. Like you girls, I hated that my mom would tell me what I should be. I never wanted to be a doctor, so I always questioned why on earth would I have to. When grandma passed away, my father took me in. He was devastated with your grandmother's death, so he took to alcohol. We fell into the wrong crowd of people until eventually we were homeless. Then, I believed the only way to get out of there was by listening to my mother and going to medical school. So I did. I got my undergraduate degree and went to medical school through loans but solely with the ambition that I didn't want to be homeless again. I put so much focus, time, and effort into something I didn't want to do because I wanted a better life. I wanted a better life for me and for my future children. I hope you girls understand that everything I do is because I want the best for you. None of you should be sorry or blame yourself for anything. I should be the one apologizing. Girls, like your mother said, we want the best for you. We always have. I remember when you girls were younger, your mother and I would always tell you to follow your dreams. From what I remember, Caroline's dream was to be a pumpkin while Sydney wanted to be a giraffe. <laughs> I guess in all that time, we somehow lost our way a bit because all we ever envisioned was us to be a happy family. That's also the reason why we tried to avoid politics during our family time. Although now it's so much harder because you both are older. But we are fully aware that even though your mother and I chose our paths, we can't expect you girls to go down the same one. And I want you both to create better stories for yourselves. And I believe the best way we can start as parents is by allowing you girls to go after what truly makes you happy. Amy, once looking down, brings out Caroline's waitress poster from behind her back and offers it to Caroline. Absolutely. Caroline springs out of the couch to give her mother the biggest hug she could have ever imagined. Joined immediately after by her sister and father, the Waltons hug for what felt like the longest of time, just embracing every second of love and comfort. After, Sydney and Jeffrey leave the mother and daughter to amend their final thoughts. 
Caroline, never let anyone tell you what you can or cannot do, ever. Always follow your dreams. Trust me, Mom. I will. <laughs>